But all the bamboo is cut way back. Oh, the lip, the lip. Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay, there we go. Hi, welcome. We're glad you're all here. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I think most people are here right now, so um, we're going to dive in. Um, so, uh, welcome to another Imbibe session. We've got a great one tonight. Another cook along, our second one. So we're really excited about that. Um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Denise Silverman. I'm the Executive Director at the Wine and Food Foundation. Uh, tonight's class is called It's a Spring Thing, an interactive chef demo with chef and sommelier Jaime Chose. And so before I introduce our chef, um, a couple quick notes about the foundation. Um, so we are doing these classes on a weekly basis right now. Um, we're alternating Wednesdays and Thursdays, so just keep an eye on our website or on the email blasts to keep tabs on the schedule coming up. Um, next week, Wednesday, April 7th, is called Rising Stars of the Loire Valley with Steve Alley. And the class, uh, the deadline to purchase your wines and to register is this coming Saturday. Um, so make sure you register before Saturday if you want to get your wines for that class next Wednesday. Um, and the wine, uh, our retail partner for that class is um, Austin Wine Merchant. That was my son. Um, and let's see. And then our first in-person imbibe class um, is on April 15th at Treaty Oak Distillery and it's sold out. Um, which we're very excited about. I mean, it's a very small class because of COVID and we're kind of testing the waters here. It is in person, outdoors. Um, we limited it to 11 people. So it's a very small class, but we're excited that it sold out. And that really kind of shows us that um, people are really ready to do this stuff in person. So we're excited about Sorry. that. We'll be doing more of that uh, as we go along. Um, and then stay tuned, we've got other classes lined up. We're just waiting for some of the details. So uh, stay tuned for late April and May. Uh, also, we just wrapped up our um, celebration of Women's History Month, as I think most of you saw. Every single day of the month of March, we featured um, uh, women in the local wine and food industry, and it was really super fun and just kind of um, a great way to engage with our community, and um, it was really just an honor to be able to, to feature all these great local women in our industry. Um, and we really appreciate all the engagement from our community and you guys. So thank you for that. If you haven't seen it, um, you can look at our feed. It's all there and we'll stay there. Um, yesterday was our last day. We featured uh, the women of our Wine and Food Foundation Board of Directors, um, which was really fun. So that's up there. It's also on our blog. So um, check that out if you get a chance. Okay, um, so let's see. We are, oh. Tonight, um, what we've been doing lately, uh, we finished the class with something called the last sip. And basically we just ask you to um, think about something, you're, you're, what are you taking away from this class tonight? Um, it can be something really um, interesting or silly or whatever comes to mind, but um, it's just a great way to, for us to hear from you guys on you know, what, what you really remember and take away from this class. Uh, okay, let me see who's here. So we have some really great people here with us tonight. A lot of familiar faces, um, a few from our board of directors. We have uh, Sergio Amaya is on our board of directors, Mary Robinson, Sansi Chen, Pat Conroy, Amber Pierce, Lauren Holbrook. So thank you for joining us, our board of directors for this class. That's awesome. Um, I want to um, do my own little personal welcome here. I have my own little mini party going on here. I have my nephew come. This is my nephew, Liam. He just turned 16 yesterday and he's a, uh, he's a budding chef. He and I have cooked many meal or few meals together for our family. And so we're really excited to cook together tonight. And then my mom and my sister are over here. She does, they don't want to be seen, so I'm going to show them from a distance. <laughs> and then my son's around here somewhere. Um, so I just figured I'd introduce my family to you because we're all excited to cook together. Okay, so let's see. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything. I am going to keep you guys on mute. Um, and then obviously you can unmute yourselves if you do want to chat, um, just to make sure we eliminate any background noise, um, but feel free to unmute yourselves or use the chat function to, um, to ask questions. I'll keep tabs on the questions. 
Um, and with that, let's, let's get cooking. Um, I'd like to introduce our host for tonight's session, Jaime Jose. He goes by he goes by Chef Jose or just Jose oftentimes. So if you hear me refer to him by Jose, that's kind of what most how most people refer to him. Um, he also happens to be a member of our board of directors. So this is an extra special treat for us. Um, so we're so excited to have you tonight, Jose, as our host and our chef and our sommelier. And I'll turn it over to you. Hey, everyone. Um, so here we go. So let me give you a little background. What I'm, what's going on here at my house? Um, so I'm really glad we did this class because it gave us the opportunity to clean the whole damn thing um, and make it nice. Um, just a little extra motivation to clean the house and finish some projects that needed to be done. Um, we're in the process of renovating a little bit of this stuff. So uh, don't, don't look too close. But um, I do have my close circle. Everybody can see me, right? Uh, my close circle is here. And if they get a little too, too rowdy, just let me know if uh, they're coming through the microphone. Uh, we're doing our best to do our, our Rachel Ray here and, uh, you know, like a studio kitchen or whatever. So um, we, we uh, ran to the store and to Amazon to get all these lights and stuff because, I mean, I, I work in a kitchen. I don't hardly ever Zoom. That's why when I'm on Zoom with you guys, it's terrible lighting and et cetera. But here we go. Um, I'm assuming that some people are cooking tonight and it's going to be your dinner. So, um, let's see if we, if I can walk you through this so that the process is, uh, is good, you know, and, and that we, uh, we come out with something that's edible at the end of the evening. Um, the idea for this was cause the weather's changing and it's springtime, obviously. And I, I wanted to do rabbit for Easter, but that, that got shot down, I guess, uh, I guess too many people were like rabbit. Come on, man. So no, I'm kidding. It's because it was too complicated. It was a short amount of time. So we it's down to one dish, uh, and we're gonna do lamb um, and some succotash. Just because um, when I think about springtime, I think about uh, like small veggies, lots of veggies. Um, so here we go. The idea is that we're gonna start with the succotash first, and then we're gonna go right into the lamb with a sauce. And theoretically, it should all be ready at the same time. And boom, done, everybody's eating. Um, so let's start with, uh, you guys uh, have the prep pretty much done, I think, uh, just for time's sake and to make it easier. But I'm gonna prepare it um, like if I was start from, from start to finish, if that's all right. Yeah, somebody, okay. I'm assuming everybody's, everybody's muted, so I don't know if, if uh, we're good to go. So um, succotash, you have the recipe. Um, it's a dish from New England it, it, originally. Um, it's because the, the local people taught other people how to make this stuff. The idea was that you get a complete protein by adding a grain and vegetables, uh, beans preferably, so you get a complete protein. And so it's gone through its evolutions over time and gone from just being two items to several different items. And then it was adopted by the South and the South liked to add a couple other fixings. So, so, so succotash, you can, you've seen it with pork, people add pork, people add bacon, people add okra. Um, uh, restaurants try to get fancy. And so we, we, uh, we use fava beans even though classically it's lima beans, but uh, fava beans being the Cadillac of the beans because they have two husks and they're a pain in the butt. So you get like this many fava beans and you end up with this many fava beans when you're done. So you got to take one husk, you blanch them, hot liquid, shock them, cold liquid, and then you got to take another husk off and then they're delicious and you, because you eat half of them while you're cleaning them. So then you end up with hardly any. I can see that someone says fava beans are the, are worth it. They totally are worth it. Um, so I'm going to keep going. I'm going to be chopping while we talk. Um, the idea is that we're going to start with the onions and the garlic first because they require a little longer cooking time. I'm assuming that most people did get 
frozen corn and frozen peas or frozen fava beans or lima beans, uh, which was uh, what was available at Central Market. I went the very first time and was successful to get fava beans. And then when I went to go get more, gone. They're just uh, not around very often. It's mainly in restaurants that, that you can get them. Right, here we go. So we chop a little onion and I want small dice just because I don't like chewing on big pieces of onion. I know that you guys are gonna do it just like this at home. So you get uh, nice even cuts of small dice, right? I've already have some cuts, just, this is just so, you know, like, like the cooking show or whatever. Hey chef, I have a question. Sure. So you're dicing these, is this the same, and this is for the succotash? Cause I think- This I is for the succotash, yes. Um, so we'll make the succotash first, then we'll make the lamb second, and then we'll make the sauce third. Okay. And so the, the succotash will, will be simmering. You know how it says, I should say on the recipe that it's simmering and you cook it so that everything is nice and tender. So that'll be working in the background while we make the lamb. Okay. Is that cool? Yeah. So on the recipe, it says sliced into quarter inch pieces from root to tip. It, I think I must have misunderstood. Quarter inch pieces, or as we call it, small dice. Oh. And that's, it's the same deal, cordage pieces. I um, chunks. No, that's fine. Chunks is cool. Just, just throw them in now so they can be ready by seven. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> I'm going to chop them up a little more. <laughs> no, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. It's totally fine. Okay. You, theoretically, you want everything to be about the same size. Okay. Just for even cooking. And, and also just so that uh, it's a easier to put a little bit of everything on one spoonful. Cool? Yeah, makes sense. I mean, it could be me. I mean, maybe I just messed up the recipe because I just was uh, having a couple glasses of wine and I just went for it. Um, that's not a lie. I was kind of drinking. Is Everybody should be drinking, right? Not the Lambrusco yet, just because that's for later. But I hope everyone has a glass of wine in their, in their uh, hand. Okay, I'm not going to cut all these just because I don't need them since I already have some cut, but you guys get the gist of it, right? So we cut the onions, boom, down. Those guys are ready to go. Garlic, I did not chop ahead of time. Cloves, I, I'm a big fan of garlic. I don't really measure it, to tell you the truth. I, I try to use a lot of it as much as I can. But uh, a couple garlic cloves, you guys follow the recipe. I'm Because I'm making... Um, for a whole crew, I think I have like eight or 10 people here. I'm gonna be using more than what the recipe says. Um, the recipe says what, one head of garlic? Half a head, half a head, which like anyone knows how many cloves are in a head of garlic, I don't know. But we're just gonna go for it. Uh, me personally, I'm probably gonna use uh, eight to 10, maybe a little bit more if I get inspired. And We'll get that going. Most of the chopping work is um, is what's the, the difficult part about this dish. The rest is pretty easy. Okay, that's about good for me. And the amount of, oh no, maybe more. A little bit more garlic. I see you over there, Denise. You're chopping your onions. Yeah, I, I'm, I have to have it right, so I'm good. <laughs> it is, it's, you know, it's, it really is just personal preference. And if you like big chunks, go for it. Not a big deal. So chef, I'm just pulling from the chat and gonna ask some of the questions that are, are popping up there. Sweet. Um, Tanya's asking if we're supposed to chop the garlic. Um, preferably, I mean, if you're gonna stew the veggies a little bit longer, they're gonna get tender anyways, if it's whole. Um, I'm doing it just because of time, for time's sake. You know, I just want to get through uh, through this dish in this period of time that we have set aside for this for this uh, little Zoom class. So, but yeah, just whole crushed. Uh, they they all work. 
um, just for today, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna chop it. Do you have an question? opinion on what we call cheater garlic? Um, I'm not. Yes, I do. I'm a chef, of course I do, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm gonna say, no, that's cool. No, um, it's that stuff is terrible. Don't do that stuff. Um, <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. I just don't think it tastes as good, you know. And if and the the whole idea is that you want to use the best ingredients, you know, so that the over end product is good. I'll, I'll put it to you in wine words, right? If I use shitty grapes, sorry, I cussed. Oops. If I use terrible grapes and I make wine, are you going to drink it? Okay, fair, fair. <laughs> I'm done. See. That's just me, but it's, you know, I get it. It's convenient, you know, um, saves a lot of time. It doesn't go bad. It's always available in your fridge. I mean, I think that it's fine for like long simmering cooking. Like you're making a sauce or a braise, something that's gonna cook forever. I think that maybe in those situations, cheat all you want, just because it's gonna be masked in so much time and cooked to death that you're really not gonna tell the difference, but in a situation like this where most of this stuff is is already pretty tender and you really don't wanna cook it to death just because it'll get mushy, you want it to have some texture. Um, I think you'll notice the difference between cheater garlic and fresh garlic. Thank you, that's helpful. Ruby. How we living, everybody cool? I gotta say, I'm very impressed by those of you who are cooking on the screen as, as some of us are, are watching. Um, I don't have that multitasking talent, so I'm impressed. You guys look like this big from where I'm, so I have no idea who's cooking and who's not, but I hope that it's turned so far so good. We haven't really started cooking. This is all the prep part, right? But we're gonna start cooking now because I have it ready to go. Um, she did, men Denise did mention that I have two screens, right? And so there's a kitchen screen back there. So that, and the sound will come from, from me because I'm on my headphones, but this way we can start to cook. Um, and you can see a little bit closer in the pan. Yes? Yeah. yeah so you guys, when, when, when chef goes over to the pan view, which if you look on your Zoom, it, it says chef as his name, uh, if you're on speaker view, it's not going to change because his mic is on on the Shose's iPhone Zoom. So you may want to change your view so you can see him when he goes over there. Yes, cool. All right. So I'm going to grab all these ingredients and take them to the pan. We're going to start the succotash. And then we'll, as I'm cooking it, we'll talk about it. Chef, we do have a question as to oh, yeah, uh, my doggies. who your sous chef is. Um, my sous chef normally is whoever is in the kitchen. Um, our friend Courtney, she likes to play in the kitchen a lot. So there she is. That's Courtney. I, I think they might have been referring to your four-legged sous chef, though. Oh, Although those guys. Courtney is lovely. Well, those guys are the cleanup crew. They're not sous chefs. Okay. Uh, do we have everything? Sure we do. All right. Um, here we go. New stove. Don't know how to use it. Okay, so we're going to heat the pan. Nice hot pan. Um, I, I like fancy pans just because I like to cook, but any, any pan at home will do. Um, as long as you have uh, plenty of surface area to work with, and uh, you know you have enough room in your pan to feed everybody that you got. So mine's a big boy because I got a lot of kids over here, and uh, we're gonna make some good show. Thirsty. Okay, uh, saute pan, olive oil. Uh, remember, you guys follow the recipe. You'll know when your oil is ready to rock because it'll start to move fast in the pan. Can you see the pan? Okay. So, we chef. Thank you, we chef. Um, 
Sorry, that's kind of loud, huh? Oops, I won't do that. So pan's working, it's getting hot. When the oil starts to run a little bit faster, then we're gonna start with the cooking process. We'll start with the onions and the garlic, as the recipe states, and we're gonna sweat those. Sweat, sweat them means that you're wanting, um, hey, get out of there. You want um, them to like cook slowly, not necessarily brown, a lot of that liquid is evaporating, concentrating the flavor. Yes? All right, good job. Onions. We're going for it. Lots of onions. Probably a little more olive oil for mine. So we can go onions, garlic, same time. if for your recipe, just because you're using a smaller amount. I have so many onions that I'm gonna let those guys go and do their thing. And then I'll throw the garlic in. After that, you want to go into the veggies that are more firm. So from there, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna throw my bell peppers and my peas. I got peas for mine just to stretch it out because lots of peeps over here, but the idea is those things that are more firm and take a lot longer to cook, you add those first so that toward the end, everything's kind of the same texture. Uh, you want a little bit of bite still to your peppers, to your peas, to your corn, to your uh, fava beans, but uh, you want the, on the onion to be tender. So that guy goes in first. Bell pepper to be tender as well. So that's working. Typical. Um, chef, you like mess with it. You really shouldn't, you should let it do its thing, but we just can't help ourselves. Did, did you guys have difficulty finding these ingredients? I know that uh, I was being told that the, the lamb was a little bit difficult, lamb loin, hard to find, and fava beans, hard to find. There's a couple of bell peppers that fell in there. I think the lamb stock was also hard to find. I got beef stock. That's cool. Um, I think I have beef stock too. The um, the plan the plan was for me to like if I had more time to break down a piece of of lamb and make the stock and do all that. But that'll be, you know, I guess uh, class number two that should have gone before class number one or whatever. But um, in here, in this one, I have beef, beef stock with lamb demi glaze working in there. And you can order this stuff. Uh, you can order it from Central Market. They'll actually do it for you if you go to the butcher and talk to them. Or you can get online and there's a company called Dr. Agnon, um that they, they make this stuff. Hold on, I'll show you. These guys, can you see that? Dr. Agnon. this one's duck. But they make they make this for duck, veal, and beef. I'm sure it's on their website, and you can order it for Amazon. Do all that stuff. Okay, you can see that our onions are sweating. Um, right when they start to get a little bit of color on the edges, that's when we're going to start to add the next couple items. They say in cooking that you're supposed to season in layers, so season it a little bit, and then. So the next ingredient season a little bit, but the next ingredient season a little bit. Um, that's fine if you have the experience. If you don't have the experience, season at the end so that you don't over season. Make sense? I'm gonna go for it. And then hopefully I still remember how to do this and everything will be fine. Okay, I don't know if you noticed, but I put the garlic in there. Garlic is in there, onions working. It's sweating, it's doing its thing. Oh, I okay. see Pat, uh, the, Pat used lima beans, so I'm not the only one that, that chose my own. <laughs> we can all use lima beans, that's fine. It's classically it's lima beans and then fancy succotashes, fava beans. I do um, lima beans. So it's fine. So let's talk a little bit about the lamb while the onions are working. So the lamb, I chose lamb, obviously spring, springtime lamb is kind of the thing. Most people have lamb for their Easter meal. 
Um, I have lamb once a week just because I think it's cool. My daughter's first meat was, come over here, show them who you are, kid. My daughter's first meat was lamb because they say it's hypoallergenic. This is a, come over here, kid. This is mini me. This is my daughter, Sinclair. Hi. So, okay, yeah, you. lamb. She was into it. She didn't know that she was having lamb, but she was a little itty bitty kid in preschool. Lamb and asparagus was her first meal in preschool. Fancy. I'm sure that most of you have your marinade like this, right? Ziploc bags or something, or in a Tupperware. Um, I like Ziploc bags so you can uh, move it around, move all the ingredients around. This one here is lamb chops because Denise is using, I think Denise is using lamb chops. But these are lamb chops and these are loins and then this is venison, just for fun, just because I had it in the, in the freezer. So we pulled it out so that we could stretch the, the meal for the kids. So lamb is working. It, you should have put it in marinade. The longer you have it in marinade, marinade the better, obviously. So um, thyme, basil, shallot, garlic, olive oil, all working, doing its thing, uh, imparting flavor. If it had acid, if it had something like that, it would tenderize the meat a little bit, but that's working. It's a party. They're popping bubbles over here, guys. So chef, do you have your marinades for both the venison and the lamb and are they marinated for different lengths of time or how does that work? Well, okay, marinades, brines, all of them have, uh, they play their part, right? Uh, so there's the, the quick marinade where you just put it, on, put it on there, you let it hang out for an hour, it penetrates so little into the meat, but it's like it does impart flavor. Now there's a deep marinade where you let it hang out in there and absorb it. Obviously osmosis happens. You add a little bit of salt so that osmosis happens. Part of the ingredient penetrates the meat and so on. Um, the longer you have it in marinade, the longer, uh, the better the flavor, but then you can definitely, if it's a salty situation, like you have um, a brine where it's salty, then you start to actually do a little bit of damage if you leave it in there too long. So all different. Um, okay, bell pepper went in, it's working. All, all different, we're gonna sweat that. You, you saw that the onions were starting to get a little bit of color. So put the bell pepper in, that's gonna drop the temperature of the pan and you, you let it start to do its thing. So drop the temperature, then it's gonna rise again, then it's gonna start to sweat the bell pepper and it's gonna start to become a little bit tender. It's also gonna get a little bit of color. So that's working. Back to the marinade thing. Um, there are, everybody knows that peanut butter and jelly are delicious. Everybody knows that peas and carrots go together. There are classic ingredients that go together um, like mint and lamb or basil and lamb or basil and tomatoes. So you try and put these ingredients that go together into your marinade unless you're some crazy chef and you want to go crazy and then you start getting adventurous with the ingredients. So, but normally, you know, you try and go with the classic flavors. I mean, I do, um, or I branch out, right? So they say, um, I don't know, the chicken goes good with fennel. Okay, how many things, how many things taste like fennel? So you, Go from there to okay well tarragon kind of tastes like fennel and so on and so on and so on and so you kind of veer a little bit in that direction but for the most part i personally like to stay with what has classically worked in flavor pairing and similar with wine they say uh stuff that grows together goes together so wine from a region you try and get ingredients from that region or a meal from that region to that obviously over time has figured out that that's the best thing in the world. So, did that answer the question? You did, thank you. Word um, up. I would just, I would make the caveat that for some of us, you know, cooking every night is, is a crazy experiment to begin with. So we appreciate the knowledge. Totally, and not just that, but like when, you, you know, like mom did, my mom did for me. So you, you ate what was available or you ate what she had in the fridge and sometimes, she would come up with a dish that you're like, wow, I've never put that stuff together, but you know, it was delicious. Maybe it's 
mom's love or maybe it was just she knew what she was doing i don't know okay bell peppers bell peppers are doing this thing they you can you can tell that your bell peppers are are doing well because they start to lose a lot of their color we don't want them to lose their color so we're gonna keep on rocking i personally did not uh buy frozen peas these are shuck peas but they're still raw so i'm throwing those guys in now because they need to cook and do their thing and like i said that's not in your recipe i added them because uh, i'm poor and i wanted to stretch my meal is that cool so chef i think we have a question in the chat about when you add a quote unquote sprig of thyme you throw the whole thing in right not like oh, the whole thing in. where you pull off the things yeah well even in rosemary you could throw the whole thing in but you just got to fish out the stem just because obviously it's you know, the material is really, really tough. Same thing, same thing with time. Um, oh man, in 2000, I worked at a fine dine restaurant where they wanted leaves of time and they handed me a pound, like this is a pound of time. And I had to pull the leaves one by one. I will never do that to anybody. So throw the whole damn thing in there and then fish out the, the, the part later. That ain't cool. Okay, so. Peas are working. They're doing their thing. I still have medium high heat on mine, actually high on mine, just because it's such a big pan and high at home is not the same as high at work. So high for now, for you at home, uh, medium, medium heat. I'm curious how many people are laughing at me in the background. That's terrible. Okay. I'm adding salt, a little bit of salt. Um, I'll add pepper at the end. Uh, peas are working. I will, me personally, I'm going to test, test the peas to see if they're tender or getting tender. Oh, one more thing. I had dental surgery, so I can't choose. So I might have to bring one of these people in here to, to check for me. So I've been on liquid diet since Monday. 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 Terrible stuff. Yeah. Well, now it'd be great if it was like liquid diet with booze, but they also have me like on antibiotics, all these things that like don't really drink. So I didn't drink until last night. Last night. Oh, oh man, I had to get, I had to have a whiskey. Diana, AKA Pat is asking what everyone is drinking. So I, I definitely uh, was able to get the Lambrusco, which is delightful. Anyone drinking anything different? We were actually just laughing that we've been on a liquid diet for the last hour, so say. Oh, excellent. <laughs> there, everybody's on liquid diet, at least for the last hour they said. Yeah, smart. Okay, so um, I've turned down the heat for, for my preparation um, because I'm going to add uh, fava beans and the corn and I'm gonna set them aside. Me personally, because I'm cooking a lot more protein, so I need it to slow down a lot. Um, if, in your home preparation, you should probably do the same thing as well so that you, because we're going slow since we're cooking as a group, and, but normally, you would just turn it down, add the corn, add the fava beans, move that aside, cook your protein, make the sauce, and then voila, hopefully someone who's cooking with you um, or visiting you is set the table and doing all that stuff, which all my people did that for me. They love us. Good job. So the the gal. A substitute. Um, is there anything that you can substitute for the paprika if you don't have paprika? Sure. I mean, Paprika is cla the classic, right? Um, obviously we're in Texas. You guys have chili powder, right? Chili powder, chili flake. You just want a little bit of spice. Um, we use the fancy organic paprika around here, but no, but seriously, you can do, you just want a little bit of spice. If you want, you could go with just fresh peppers, like throw a, a spicy red pepper in there, like Anaheim chili or something like that to give it the spice. but um, you know, if you couldn't get it or don't have it, 
I'm sure there's chili flake or, or chili powder in your pantry, right? Okay, good. So I'm adding a couple sprigs of thyme, right? About, about that many. I love thyme, so I use the, the shit out of it. Sorry, the stuff out of it. Um, I went to culinary school in France, so um, tarragon and thyme, lots of it. Okay, I'm gonna go with the corn. Uh, corn, obviously, fibrous grain. It can it can hang out for a lot longer. Um, plus, it's probably if everybody used frozen corn, it's really really cold still. So throw that sucker in there, and then throw your fava beans in. If okay. you were lucky, go ahead. I was just going to say, as usual, Pat likes to show off a little bit and is asking, should he use his Hungarian, Spanish, or smoked paprika? <laughs> yeah, well, aren't you fancy? I use, <laughs> I would just use the regular paprika. I use the smoke when I want smoke flavor. I use the Spanish when I'm making paella. So that's, that's Saturday. Paella is on Saturday. Okay, so I added all my goodies to mine. I'm gonna, the thyme, I'm gonna season it a little bit more. A little black pepper. Make sure that the, the recipe has the quantities. It's to taste, seriously. Throw it in there. Some people like it, a lot of people, some people don't. I like it subtly, um, unless it's uh, beef. I'm gonna go big on beef. So I'm moving mine to the side. You folks, um, cover it, turn it way down. You want it to simmer um, and do its thing nice and slow. You want those uh, the veggies to become tender, but not overcooked. Okay, if it starts, to, if all the green stuff starts to turn army green, you killed it. So keep them vibrant and fresh, and you should be fine. Ruby, okay, good. Next, we're gonna start on the lamp. I'm using two pans um, just because I I need the, the power. I think that the camera's on this one, so we'll use that one for the camera. This one will be working in the background. Let those guys get hot. For this, we pull it out of the marinade. We're gonna pull it out of the marinade. These are in marinade still. Um, I, I personally, it doesn't bother me to sear it with the marinade. Most people don't, classically you're not supposed to just because it'll burn faster. Plus also you want to have the, the protein exposed so that you get a good sear. So I say you scrape it all off. Um, I scrape it off and then I save it and then I throw it in the pan when I'm making my sauce. That's me. Um, I go for it. I don't normally cook by the rules most of the time. Okay, so Pull your protein out of the marinade. Take the marinade off. We're doing that here with these guys. Hopefully, you know, this has added some lovely flavor to it. I'm using gloves uh, at home. Most people don't use gloves, which is cool. Or maybe everyone uses gloves now because of COVID. I don't say. I think everyone here's double vaccined. Sweet. Except for these guys, because they're tiny, tiny, but they're in my bubble, so that's cool. So selfishly, I'm gonna say thank you for supporting the industry. Which industry? I work for a vaccine manufacturer that has one of the COVID vaccines. Voila. Well, I mean, I didn't do it to support the, the industry. I did it to stay alive. I know. Keep I, the, I the just, people that I love alive. You know, I, like I get. It, I'm joke, kidding. But I'm I appreciate kidding. it. What a joke. No, no, no. I, I mean, I'm so stoked that it's happening and that people are doing it. Okay, we're gonna go. Uh, I, don't, I mean, I, I think every did everybody was able people get able. Blah, 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 blah. Did everybody get loin or did they get chops? What's the deal? I got chop. What did everyone else get? Everyone's going to say chop. Yeah, I have a feeling. Or say nothing. 
sorry, you can stop on that one. We're gonna start on that. Okay. My pans are hopefully hot. They should be. Um, for the searing process, we're not gonna use olive oil. We're gonna use a high temperature oil like canola, grape seed, something like that. Um, if you if you have it, most people have canola or vegetable oil in their zone, so they can use that stuff. Okay, we're going to season these guys um, liberally on the outside, obviously, because you want it's, it's such a the bigger the meat, the more seasoning you use on the outside. Because the the idea is when you cut a slice, you want to have over season on the outside, big old piece, boom. Put it in your mouth, delicious. It's enough seasoning for that whole bite. Right? right? So chef, I think we have a couple with chops and we've got someone that's responded that they have bone and loin. Cool. So then we'll, we're gonna go with the chops so that that'll satisfy, I think everybody uh, in, in the group. Cool. So hot pan, I'm using grapeseed oil. Put that guy in there. These pans have been uh, hot already, so they're they're cruising. The oil is cruising. This part's kind of messy. You want to le season the outside. Can you see this? You season the, the outside pretty liberally. I'm using salt and pepper, um, and that's it. I'm, theoretically, the the beautiful basil and shallot and thyme has penetrated. Boom. So the fatty side down. This is the part that uh, is gonna prove to be a little bit difficult over Zoom uh, with the chops. Just because the chops is gonna take a little bit longer to cook than the loin is, because of the bone, uh, the thickness of the meat, etc. So. For those that have just the loin, it'll be the recipe will be a little bit more accurate with the uh, cook time. But we're gonna I'm gonna switch the pans and show you the loin also, so that we have a better understanding of, of the cooking process, right? So I turned this down a little bit just because I'm I'm at home and I don't want to make a mess with the oil. If it was a restaurant or if it was work, I'd be blasting it and splattering everywhere and then I'll clean it later. But you wanna sear it hard so that uh, you get a nice caramelized color on the outside. We're gonna, we're gonna manipulate the meat throughout the pan so that we get all the surfaces done. And then you want internal temperature of roughly 120 degrees, uh, or which is medium rare, or you want whatever preferred doneness you enjoy. Um, Lamb to me should be eaten medium or medium. That's about it. Just because uh, after that, it just uh, it starts to get really, really gamey and really dry right away. Yes. Nope. Nothing from the peanut gallery at home. Those that have their cameras on all look very busy at work right now. working hard. I, I chose to pull out a cast iron pan because most people have cast irons at home. They're great. They hold their heat, non-stack, et cetera. Oh, yeah, I built a fundamental rule, guys. So when you're putting stuff in the pan that has oil, put the tip in and then drop it out, away from you so the splash goes toward the stove and not towards you. Earlier, I messed that all up. Just so y'all know, don't do that. Rookie move. If I was a pro, I would have had like a couple already prepared and be like, oh, the magic of television. Here we go. Um, I hope everyone has the time to hang out still and, 
and wait till this stuff gets nice and cooked. All right, you notice that I did not season the, the opposite side, so I'm gonna go ahead and season the opposite side in the pan. I'm cooking with gas now. Hot. Okay, a little. Uh, take a step back and go back to the second task. So, once you add all the ingredients, then you add your thyme, season it with paprika, salt and pepper. Taste it. Make sure that it's seasoned. Um, adjust the seasoning as needed. Cover it, and then let it simmer, and the veggies do their thing. They'll be working. I haven't added I haven't added the paprika to mine yet or finished the seasoning yet. I'll do it at the end for myself. Um, for this here, we're uh, letting that sear. You guys should theoretically sear a lot faster. Uh, so for for you folks at home, I'm going to speed it up a little bit by taking two loins out. I'm assuming that most people are cooking way less um, protein than I am. So I'm going to pull some out. That'll increase the speed of the, the heat of the pan and, and the cooking process. So pull these out. Put these guys in the middle. That way they're working hard. The other thing that you could do is do the opposite. Um, start with the protein with a, with a low oven. Say you have an oven at 200 degrees and you have a pro thermometer or a thermometer where you can check the temperature on these guys, right? So you would sear them, flip them, sear them again, or just sear them really heavy, flip them and put them in your oven at 200 degrees with a probe thermometer. And while that's cooking in the oven slowly, you're making the suck attacks on the top of the stove. Okay, but for, for today, I did it the opposite way just so that uh, more like a home cook style. Uh, professionally, we would have done it the opposite way so that the meat is already working and then you do the vegetables and then it goes out and the service. You guys see that? We're getting there. You want nice? Nice uh, caramelized color there. I personally, I'm going to go ahead and start the oven. I don't know how to do this. This brand new oven. Go. The modern ovens have Wi-Fi. This thing has Wi-Fi. It's so crazy. Did you say 200 on the oven? Well, if if you're gonna if you're gonna go the opposite process where you're cooking the protein first and then doing the second attack second. Yes, 200 because you need it to cook slowly it, because I'm doing the opposite, which is the second attack is made. Now I'm trying to rush the meat. So I'm going to do 350 because I'm doing, I'm, I'm already done with the first process and people are out there getting crazy and they're ready to eat. So um, you, would, you would switch it around and high temperature in the oven, put it in the oven. You're still gonna pull it out at the same temperature, 120 degrees, because you want to serve it medium rare. You pull it out at 120, it hangs out while you're, you know, dressing up the sides and making the salad and whatever. And then it slowly relaxes and rests and then you can serve it at the perfect temperature. Right? Uh-oh, a little dark, don't do that. So I, Lisa, you're doing it with me on the, on the chop. I lifted the chop of the top so that it would get the other little zone seared. Don't pay attention to that. That's no big deal. It's fatty. Nobody eats that part anyways. But um, this part here, we do have to pay a little bit more attention because it's direct to the meat. Uh, so we'll raise it and get coloring on that side. 
That looks pretty good, right? Karma life there. So we're gonna flip that guy. Cool, let that guy hang out. Um, normally on your protein, if you're doing this size loin, once you get to this color here, uh, the initial side, the whole protein was cold. So the cook time on the first side is longer. Once you flip it, like we just did there, the temperature has already had ro risen in this piece of meat. So the second side of cooking is gonna be le less. Okay, so you're not gonna get the same color on the, on the back side as you would on the front side. Um, but this is just kind of a way to see that you know not to overcook your meat. Um, me, I do it by feel. Um, temperature 120 and above. Um, do not, if, even if you can help it, try not to go above uh, 130 on your meat. I mean, they do actually get more flavor, but they also become drier the more you cook them. So believe it or not, well done meat has more flavor than medium rare meat. However, it's so dry that you can't enjoy it. Just because like anything, when you evaporate the liquid, you concentrate the flavor. So that's essentially what you're doing when you're cooking your meat, you're drying it out, caramelizing the color. So yes, more flavor, but less moisture. Anybody, everybody cool? Questions, comments, right? Tanya, I thought I got a flyby view of yours and it looked great as you transferred it over. Yeah, the temperature got really, really high. <laughs> and I had it on medium, so I don't know what happened. A high quality pan or something. Okay, so let's, um, just for the sake of my party, I'm going to pull this one, the, the lamb chops from the stove, and I'm going to stick them in the oven. The oven is not hot yet, but I, it gives me time to focus on other things for now. So I'm sticking it in the oven just like that. It's doing its thing. I turn this one off, and we're going to focus on this guy here. Um, so they're, they're steering. I will switch it out in a second. Um, just for presentation sake, because so the, for the sauce, because I wanted to make the sauce in the stainless steel pan and not the cast iron. It works in either one, but just visually for you folks, it's easier to see it on a stainless steel pan. So I have the stock hot here. Um, I have it hot for two reasons. One, to make it faster. Two, because I'm trying to reduce it and concentrate the flavor of my stock. Okay, if you don't have stock, and you're using demi gloss, it's already concentrated. So you don't even need to worry about that stuff. Okay, but the idea is that on the bottom of your pan, you're getting a lot of these uh, beautiful um, pieces of caramelized um, meat and juices to the bottom of your pan. The fancy people, they call it fond, fond in French. And you want to release that stuff from the pan. So when you pour liquid into a pan, everyone knows this, like when you have a hot pan, you throw it in the sink, you put the water on it, like it kind of comes out clean. That's the same deal that you're doing with the pan to make your pan sauce. So you're, we're gonna release all those ingredients from the pan into the, suspend it into the liquid and that's gonna be part of our sauce. So that's what's happening with the sauce. So the sauce will be just that, it'll be, the pan juices and pan meat and loveliness that's in there, minus the fat. So we're gonna pour that oil out and all that fat out. If you keep it in the pan, it's fine. Um, you get a cleaner sauce if you don't, because you're gonna enrich it with fat anyways. 
But if you don't, and you just pour the liquid in there, if you boil it, it's gonna rapidly boil in your pan because everything's hot and it's gonna emulsify into the, the liquid anyway. So me personally, I'm gonna pour it out because it's, it's oil and I'm gonna add better fat or more flavorful fat like butter. So that's what I'm gonna use for my sauce. This is what the recipe says. Um, just a heads up, you don't, you wanna make sure that the fat that's in your pan gets discarded. Anybody have questions so far? Okay, so let's, let's, um, I'm gonna turn this really low for a second and we're gonna talk about the wine. How are we doing on time? Seven, are we running out of time? Oops. No, you're good. It's seven and we put this till 7.30, so we're, we're doing well. Beautiful. So um, I'm gonna turn this way down, let it do its thing and we're gonna talk about the wine. You gotta drink this, you gotta drink this guy first. I should have mentioned this sooner. Um, I hope everybody has their wine chilled. So Lambrusco is served chilled. I hope I that- uh, in, I put it in the notes. I think I said 55 to 60. Okay. Um, this guy has got a fancy little cap. Just another party. He popped some bubbles left and right around here. So this, this uh, Lambrusco, um, I picked it because we're still kind of, kind of in cold weather approaching warmer weather and just it's easier trend i feel like it's a really good transition into your white wines it's like go go from a heavy red then we're going into whites to get something in the middle so that you can have a red wine that is it's enjoyed chilled so i've had mine in the fridge and it's probably a little bit too cold so I'm gonna go ahead and pour myself some now and let it come up a little bit. But oh, that's cold deal. I don't know how many of you are able to get it, but it's got a little plastic seal. Take that guy off. Next time we have knives in our pockets all the time. It is a little uh, effervescent as well. So this, this um, Lambrusco comes from Emilia Romagna. So I don't know how many people have been in Italy, but Emilia Romagna is awesome. Um, it's where a lot of the beautiful food in Italy comes from. Okay, so like uh, pasta, Parma ham, uh, Parmesan cheese. Lambrusco, the home of Lambrusco, Emilia Romagna. Um, considered to be probably one of the biggest uh, culinary destinations of Italy. Um, really. Whereabouts, whereabouts in Italy is that, Chef? So everyone knows where Rome is, right smack, almost smack in the middle, a little bit to the left. So just, just north of Rome, about... It's, it's funny because we're from Texas. So we're like, oh, it's right over there. Um, probably around a two hour drive north of Rome, a little bit to the right. Boom, there you are. That's, that's Emilia Romagna. And it, it goes all the way to, to the edge of Italy on the right, to the coast, and then almost all the way to the left. So um, let's see if I can get an image here. So is it so, part of Tuscany or no? Um, I guess the northern part of Bologna could be considered a little bit part of Tuscany. Um, sorry, the southern part could be considered part of Tuscany. So you go from Rome to Florence to Bologna, 
and Tuscany is considered to be like right outside of Rome to where Florence is. And then just a little bit north of that is Emilia Romagna. So it just kind of looks like it's just wide, narrow and wide. It goes across the most of the you know, northern part of the of the boot. Um, so it's it's kind of at an angle too. So just south of Milan, all the way to the coast. Uh, to San Marino, somewhere in there. And that's the area that has all these beautiful little cities of uh, Bologna, Modena, uh, Parma. Uh, so, I mean, these are, these are cities that are, you know, like the number one restaurant in the world is in, is in Modena. So good stuff there. So Lambrusco, uh, everybody has, should have it chilled. really, really cool um, color. So it's like you get that little bit of the, um, like that bright pink plus the bubbles, really pretty. The, the bouquet should be a little bit, I mean, I mean, I know that when I'm, when I'm drinking, I'm like, mm, perfect spring only because I probably drink it in springtime a lot. Um, but um, this one specifically, uh, the texture on it should be a little bit heavy. Just because of the producer, um, a little, it's, it's um, tannic, so it's dry, dry in the mouth. This stuff here specifically is, it's organic. Um, it's a blend, so it's non-vintage. And also, um, it's pretty young that the, 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 uh, the winery is a young winery. Um, it's only been around for a little bit, but uh, obviously the, the varietal and the area has been, I mean, it's successful and, and around for forever. But um, I, I'm guessing that the, the, the fact that it's cold, that it's red, um, that it does have some structure is gonna be able to hang out with, you know, the meat, the meat part of our meal, and then complement the, the veggie part of our meal, so that it's a good transition from from going into winter into springtime. So, this is the reason why I picked this wine. I hope that you enjoy it, um, and and we're able to get this one specifically. Um, sometimes Lambrusco, um, people think that it's a little bit sweet. Uh, this one is not so sweet, and also uh, carries a lot of a lot of structure to it. Not just the not just the bubbles, but also uh, the mouth feel. So uh, I don't. I hope that you have it in your glass right now, and you can taste it, and tell me what you think so far. And chef, so aside from the lamb, what other um, foods would you pair with the lambrusco? And and I think Sansi has an answer to start with, which would be um, a nice charcuterie, um, cheese, meat, no doubt, balsamic vinegar. What else would me you do? To me, this is um, this is kind of on the same wavelength as rosé, uh, in that it goes it goes well with almost anything. Um, it's it's got a little bit of both, right? So it's it's got that that, that red grape quality is that it gives you the structure, gives you the meat, gives you the, the body, and it's got those the, the effervescence that helps to to break uh, stuff down in the mouth in the mouth feel for the the fattiness and. It also has the, the aromatics bring the bouquet around so you get the great, you know, uh, sense of smell to all these beautiful things. So me, uh, anything to me that is uh, springtime, lots of herbs, um, obviously it's, it's, it's Italy. So when I think of Italy, I think, I think thyme, I think bay leaf, um, I think basil, I think uh, savory dishes. Um, it's just, to me, it's just so versatile just because of uh, all those things that Lambrusco has uh, going for it. So yeah, yeah, charcuterie, no doubt, or always awesome. Not just springtime for me. I, I like it in the fall too. It's kind of in the same wavelength for me as Gamay so that I have it, I have it in October, November a lot. And I have it this time of year a lot. And then I had it two months ago a lot. So um <laughs> I mean, I think it's just, a, it kind of has a, it has a lot, it has a lot going on, which, oh, she's stealing my glass. My daughter's stealing my glass. So, 
Um, what, Sansi, what do you think? I just put that we drink it with crawfish too in the spring. Um, <laughs> it's a good alternative well, to where we would normally drink beer. You know, we will sub in uh, Lambrusco, you know, so. No doubt. I mean, uh, when I think about, I mean, this is Texas, right? So we're, we're gonna go, we're, deny I snuck in some venison because hunting season just ended. And so everybody's got deer in their freezer. So that's the segue to, to what's happening locally is that we are gonna have it with barbecue. We are gonna have it with venison. We are gonna have it with crawfish. Um, like I said, it's like rosé, whatever. We have rosé with everything. So you might as well have Lambrusco with everything as well. Okay, so I think we've covered most things. Like with um, we, the succotash is working, it's doing its thing. The veggies are are stewing, and all the flavors are coming together. The meat you're gonna pull it at your preferred doneness. Um, mine, obviously, because I I'm doing the class and, and teaching. It's it's gonna be. I'm gonna continue to work on mine for a, a little bit longer. You at home, same deal. It's it's working in your personal kitchen so that you're gonna pull your lamb when it is hopefully medium rare. Uh, if you need a, if you have a temperature probe or a, a poke thermometer, go for it, check it in there, make sure that you're not overcooking it. If you wanna do it old school style, this is the deal, you use your hand. And if you touch these two guys together, just barely touch them. And then you touch this part of your hand, it should be rare, right? And then you touch your um, middle finger and your thumb, and that should be medium rare. And then there is no medium because no one really needs it medium anymore. And then you touch these two and that's medium well, and then you touch your pinky and that's well done. It's kind of a rule of thumb. It's just, uh, it doesn't, it's not perfect and not accurate, but theoretically it gives you a, a little bit of an idea of how your meat should feel to the end when you're sticking your finger in it. So I'm gonna do the same thing over here. So that's about medium for me. I'm gonna pull these out. I'm gonna check on my lamb that's in the oven and do the same thing, or maybe take a, a temperature probe to that and go from there. Does everyone feel comfortable with me ending the cooking process there? Or do you wanna, do you have any more questions or comments? Chef, do you want to um, give us a little bit of information about you and your background? Sure. Um, I, I moved to Austin over 20 years ago, uh, initially to go to culinary school. And at the time, there was this little bitty school called Le Chef that I signed up for. I had already been cooking in El Paso, where I'm from. And I felt like I wasn't progressing fast enough. So I left that school. And I studied in France, I studied at a school called Le Notre. And I was going to France taking classes, working as a private chef with a buddy of mine, uh, Bobby Cortez, and just kind of really burning the candle at both ends, going to school, working and studying all at the same time. And then, uh, you know, the, the lady who I was seeing got pregnant, my daughter, was born and then it was like, oh, this stuff is for real. I really have to work. So then I took as many jobs as I could once I got out of culinary school. And so I was I was a chef at many, many restaurants in Austin. Um, started my very, very first chef job was Ranch 616. And I was, I got hired as the sous chef right, uh, right from the start. And I worked my butt off because I ran that restaurant I ran their bakery and I ran their sister restaurant, Ella's, all at the same time. And I didn't know what I was doing. So I was, and my daughter was an infant. So I, I never saw her, worked a lot, continued to work, work, work um, until I was able to really be the chef, like for real, and have a, a schedule that was a little bit more relaxed. And that was when I started working for McGuire Mormon over. Oh man, I want to say it was like 12 or 13 years ago, something like that. 
Um, I was the chef at Lambert's and then I was the chef at Perla's and then Clark's and then I was a chef for all three. Um, and I just stayed in restaurants for the longest time. And I tried to transition as I was getting older to a front of the house job just because physically I felt that it was better for me for longevity in life. Um, but it's hard to move out of the kitchen when everyone knows you as the chef, no one knows you as a wine guy. So I started to go through the court of master sommelier to become sommelier. And I was like, well, I, I've always been into wine, but it's time to at least figure out a way to get a title so that people take it a little bit more seriously. So I went through that process and was halfway to getting to where I was an advanced sommelier and then COVID happened. And so COVID happened, a couple other things happened in the industry and it's all kind of come to a standstill. So now uh, with restaurants being closed, I work as a private chef and now I'm like, forget being a restaurant chef and forget being a sommelier. I like this private chef stuff because I work Monday through Friday and I asked for a Thursday off and they're like, yeah, no problem. So here I am hanging out with you guys on a Thursday night where normally I'd be, geez, I'd be in the middle of the rush right now at a restaurant at 713 on a Thursday. So um, that's what I do. Um, proud father of my daughter, Sinclair. And then I had these little guys, two of them that uh, they're a pain in the butt. And then my little lady, Amy, who's around here somewhere. I don't see her and that's it. That's me. And I, Amy, I don't know if you can see her. Yeah, there you are. You're over there. So yeah, that's me. And I, I do my best to um, help out when I can. Uh, COVID's been tough, but we're helping it out and having a good time. And I'm glad to be here. That's awesome. Thank you. And we're, we're glad your employers gave you the night off so you could spend it with us. Um, awesome. Does it, does anyone have any questions and also be thinking about your, your last sip, your takeaway for tonight um, before we sign off tonight? And I do have one question before we get into that. I'm curious, my, my sauce is cooking down. How, how, how much would you cook it down? How, how thick would you make okay. it? This is, let's go back to the sauce because um, we didn't finish that part. So um, here on the stove, we're going to, we're going to go for it. We're going to make a simple pan sauce, uh, which is what the recipe is referring to. Okay. So I pulled out the stainless steel pan so you all can see it. I'm going to do some stuff around here just to make it easier. So, say, so you pulled your proteins out of your pan. Here's your pan. And all this fat that's in the pan, you want to discard it. So um, obviously you can just dump it in the sink if you want, or just pour it into a container and then discard it the other way. Um, but I'm, I'm going to pour it into a container in the sink. There's my pan. It's still hot because I just pulled mine out of the oven. So it's hot. There should be some lovely juices on the bottom of this in your pan at home. Mine for some reason doesn't have very many, but we're gonna, what they call deglaze the pan, which is to release all those bits and loveliness that were stuck to the bottom of the pan. So the pan is hot. You have your stock or your ladle and you're gonna deglaze. It should, it should, boil right away and that's going to cook down if your stock is already enriched and already thick you don't need to cook this down as much okay they in a pan sauce is loose okay you could make it more robust and thicker by by reducing it a lot or adding flour or cornstarch or all these other things but i chose to make this a simple dish so pan sauce, so hot pan, it reduces. This is where I personally add the marinade ingredients to this. So um, 
I'm going to, I'm going to do it for you guys just now. This is not what I would do for tonight's dinner, but for the class, boom. So the sauce is working. I'm going to add the shallots and the basil because the recipe says basil jus. So I'm adding all this to my stock and cook it down. So now the shallots and the basil and the thyme are imparting flavor into the liquid. When you get to a point where it's at the desired thickness, um, which to me, this would be a, a, loose, a, a loose preparation, then this is where you add the butter in the recipe. So we're, um, I'm gonna reduce mine just, just a tad. So it's a little bit more rich. So I think that on the recipe, it calls for two pats of butter, just because theoretically you're cooking for two people with only eight ounces of, of the, the lamb loin. Obviously, because I'm making a ton, I would add a lot more. But so now the liquid has infused with the basil, with the shallot, and then you add your butter to it and you want to swirl the pan so that the butter gets emulsified into the liquid and that will also thicken it. Voila. And that's it. Then taste it, season it to how you want it. And then you can set this aside um, as long as you use it uh, rather quickly, it should not break, which means that the fat separates from the, from the liquid. So you can set that aside, serve your lamb. I, I would just pour this whole liquid on top. If you wanna get fancy, you would strain it and take all this stuff out of there and then pour the liquid. Most people aren't fancy at home. So you just pour it right on top of your, your lamb and serve it up. That's, that's how easy that sauce is. It's just a pan sauce. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Cool. All right. So before we wrap up, I think we'll um, go around and see what everyone's uh, last sip is. What were, what were your biggest takeaways tonight? Um, and I'll start by saying, actually, one of the things I really want to remember and keep in mind for the future is I loved, um, first of all, what Sansi was saying about Lambrusco being a great substitute for beer. Um, that's like, I think that's a great thing to keep in mind for summer when we're not wanting to drink big red heavy wines and not maybe wanting to drink as much heavy beer. Um, so I think Lambrusco is a, is a great um, substitute. And then also um, really just kind of knowing about that region that I didn't know about before in Italy chef that you were talking about. So, um, so those are my takeaways for tonight. Um, anyone else want to pipe in with theirs? Sure. This is Amber. So I will say that the conversation about, um, similar to wine, that marinade is very much, uh, what grows together, goes together. And I appreciate being able to carry that consistency through. And then I also appreciate the comments about cheater garlic because I do love me some cheater garlic at times, but it's, it's helpful to know when it's useful and when it's probably a little bit best if you just use the fresh stuff. That's a good one, Amber, thank you. Who else, Pat, do you have any takeaways from tonight? Yes, I do. Uh, the the uh, what I found interesting was the the description of the you know rare to well done meat. Now I always like it either rare or medium rare, uh, but I never really thought about the more flavors as the meat dries out more. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm still going to have everything rare and medium. Rare. Me too. <laughs> so uh, interesting observation. I had never thought about that. Yeah, that is a good one too, because I, I stick to medium rare myself. So that's something to keep in mind. Well, I mean, because you want the balance of, uh, of flavor and texture, right? So the, the me personally is it's medium rare for most meats with the exception of ribeye. I like my ribeye medium because it's so fatty, but you know, cook the shit out of the outside so that it gets that cool car caramel, you know, and plus the texture. 
but then the inside still is really juicy. So you get that flavor on the outside. And that's why I said you over season the outside so that obviously it didn't penetrate, but you cut yourself a nice slice of meat, boom, pop it in your mouth. Delicious. Cause that flavor is enough to, to season the whole piece of meat that you cut. Yeah. And, and then with the right sauce, the demi gloss or something like that, that really makes it perfect. So <laughs> yeah, this, this pan sauce is delightful. I could drink it. <laughs> drink uh, it. Yeah. Put it, on, put it on your meat. <laughs> Tanya, Sergio, anyone have any final takeaways before we sign off tonight? Well, this is the first time I made lamb and I just tasted it. It's fantastic. So thank you. You're welcome. That's my take. You're welcome. I can make lamb. Awesome. <laughs> Are you, lamb, I mean, it's so good for you. You know, I, I think that everyone should have lamb at least once, once every two weeks. I mean, it's a little spendy, obviously, but, you know, it's good. It's really good. Um, uh, goat is another one. I mean, it's a little bit. Uh, people kind of think of it as just like, well, it's just gross it, because it's it, the scent is strong, right? But believe it or not, here in Texas, we we raise most of the goat for the Northeast. It all gets sent up north for all the ethnic food that they make up there. So there's it's available to us. It's delicious. Um, so you know, these are these are just things that we should be consuming. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure I, I overcooked a couple pieces of my lamb. So I'll, and I have family here, so we'll all be testing. I mean, I, I might have to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was kind of hard to multitask and pay attention to all this. So I definitely hit a couple that were a little bit long, but we'll, we'll kind of see the flavor difference in, in those. So it'll be interesting to test them out. Well, if no one has anything else, I want to thank you so much, Chef, for putting this all together for us tonight. This was fantastic. It's being Welcome. recorded as usual. So um, we'll be posting this, uh, our whole series of Imbibe soon, working through some technological uh, challenges to get that done, but it will be all posted soon for us to go back and refer to. Um, so thank you again, Chef. Thank you all for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. Night. Enjoy your meal. Have a good night.